Silver. Test, test, test. One, two.
Good morning, Bamble Church family. Good to see everyone this morning. Uh, if you're online uh, worshiping with us, thank you for joining us there. If you're visiting with us this morning, thank you for coming uh, to worship with, here with us at the Bamble Church of Christ. Every Sunday morning is a special morning, but this morning is even more special. Uh, we get to start our service off with a baptism. Um, and it's so exciting. Uh, yes, Matthias. After we sing this first song, Matthias will be baptized, and you should have seen his joy this morning as he walked through there. Um, and so it's going to be a special, special morning. So let's stand as we sing. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow at his name. Cause he is the wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. And he is the everlasting father. He is the prince of peace. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every knee shall bow at his name. There is no other name, no name by which we're saved. There is no other name but Jesus. Sing this out. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow at his name. Every knee shall bow at his name. Every knee shall bow at his And we have spent the last hour talking about his story. And all week long, he has felt this conviction from Jesus to be baptized. In fact, he said, I need to be cleansed. He has an amazing story. We'll share more about that next week. But we're ready to uh, take his confession before his church family. Matthias, do you believe that Jesus is the son of the living God? Yes. Amen. Amen, Amen church. Based on your confession, Matthias. You are to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All of your sins are forgiven, and God will place his Holy Spirit in your heart and bless you all the days of your life. Church. I said I wasn't going to tell anybody, but I couldn't keep it to myself. No, I couldn't, couldn't keep it to myself. Oh, no, I couldn't, couldn't keep, keep it, it to myself. I said I wasn't going to tell anybody, but I couldn't keep it to myself. What the Lord has done for me, for me, you ought to have been there. Church, you 
sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters lifted me, now say, am I? Love lifted even me, love lifted even me, when nothing else could help, love This morning's scripture comes from Isaiah 25, 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all people. The sheet that covers all nations, he will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord we trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Amen. As we prepare our hearts and minds for communion, we'll sing, here's my heart. Here's my heart, Lord, and here's my heart, Lord, here's my heart, Lord, speak what is true, so here's my
Over the last few weeks, our sermons have been focused on the theme of hospitality. David talked to us last week about the parable of the Good Samaritan. Gerardo concentrated his thoughts on hospitality several weeks ago on being an active, engaged listener. Today in our lesson on the great banquet found in Luke 14, Jesus says, go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. In preparation for my thoughts today, I looked up the word hospitality in my concordance. It said, see kindness. Kindness was defined as, quote, having a hospitable, friendly attitude toward others, end quote. For the Christian, human kindness or hospitality is so much more than being friendly. It is commanded in the scripture and is one of the aspects of the fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5. Humans can express kindness by showing forgiveness to others, helping the needy, helping, helping victims of injustice, helping strangers, caring for the sick, so many ways. God and Christ's kindness and hospitality include all of these aspects, of course, but God's hospitality and kindness is something that is so far beyond what we can even imagine. So when we think about God's kindness and his hospitality, we are gathered here at his table. We are gathered here to share not his things, but to share himself. As we take the bread and the wine, we are sharing the Lord. We are sharing what he has offered to us and invited us to be part of. Come share the Lord. Let's pray. Oh Lord, our God, you are our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. You, O oh God, are our fortress, and we praise you. We recognize that you are king over all the earth and reign over all nations as you are seated on your holy throne. There is none like you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. In your kindness, mercy, and compassion, O oh God, you have given us salvation. When your kindness and love appeared in the flesh, that Jesus, the one who saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of your mercy, O oh God, your ultimate sacrifice, this gift beyond compare, we thank you now for this bread that represents Jesus' body on the cross for us and this wine that represents his blood that flowed from his body. We are humbled in your presence 
We say this prayer with gratitude and awe. In Jesus' name, amen. This past week, I was reading an article about family ministry written by John Ellis Steen. As he was speaking about his upbringing in the church, he said, My parents always wrote the tithe check first because my mom said she did not want to die owing God any money. It made me laugh and it made me smile, but it also made me think, am I giving with that same sense of urgency and priority, that God should come first and foremost. And more importantly, am I modeling that for my children? We have four different options of giving. They are listed on the screens in front of you and around on the sides. As we pause to think of our own offerings, Take a moment to thank God for his blessings in your life, no matter how small they may seem. Let's pause as we give thanks to God. Next Sunday, August 7th, Brandon and I have some very special plans for all of our children from kindergarten all the way up to our seniors. 
It is Promotion Sunday. Your children will go to their regular Bible class and then they will promote up after they get there and we'll take care of that. So please come for Bible class, but also come for worship because we have some very special things planned for them at the end of our worship time um, where we will have a time of blessing over them, their parents, their grown-ups, um, all of our educators and our, and our family mem members who are working in education. We want to send you into this next school year knowing that you are being prayed over that you are being thought of, and that we are always here if there were to be a need. It is now time for our children's offering. Our children's offering will be used up by four friends in Haiti, Sofiana, Desna, Cleveson, and Dodoni. After this offering, stepping stones is available for ages three to five years old. It is out the back doors and down the hall to the right. Our kids can now come down for their offering. Good job. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. And He, he died for us. And He, he died for us. Amazing grace, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Said it was amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And I know that saved a wretch like me. That saved a wretch like me. When we've been there, when we've been there 10,000 years. When we've been there, when we've been there 10,000 years. Side of the Lord, so you better humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and I know that He will lift you up, and He will lift you. Stay right there. And He will lift you. I'll sing it till you believe it. This next song, uh, Brother Gaddy, are you in here? Brother Gaddy introduced, uh, reintroduced this back to me uh, a couple weeks ago. It came up to me. I hadn't sang this song in probably 15, 20 years. Um, and it's called, some of you may know it, it's maybe new to some people, it's called Heaven is on the Other Side. And uh, this song, probably when I sang it 15, 20 years ago, I was thinking completely geographical. Heaven is on the other side, way up in the sky somewhere in the beyond. But as I was preparing for this week, I started thinking of heaven is on the other side of all of our troubles. Heaven is on the other side of any death or loss that we are going through or have gone through. Heaven is on the other side of the troubles at work. Heaven is on the other side of failed relationships and marriages. Heaven is on the other side of all that stuff. And then I started thinking even our best days, the days that we love and we want to remember forever, heaven is even better than that. And that's an exciting thought. So this will be an easy song to catch on to. 
and we'll, uh, we'll start with the basses again. Heaven's on the other side, 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 I will make it, I will make it, heaven's the bases, on just the bases again, the you got it, the side, heaven's on the other the side head, the zone, the the side oh, head, the zone, the the side head, the zone, the the side. I will make it, I will make it head. Sopranos are coming in. The the side head, the zone, the the side head, the zone. The side the side the side the side the side I will make it, I will make it, and the the side the side the side the side the the side the side It's amazing. Ah. And let's get the bases, just the bases, real strong. Heaven's on the other side. Heaven's on the other side. This is the part where all men don't want to be bases, right? Sing this out. Heaven's on the other side. I will make it. I will Everybody make sing it that part. The zone, the other side. The zone, the other side. The zone, the other side. Oh, yeah. The zone, the other side. The zone, the other side. I will make it. I will make it. All right, let's go back to our parts. Well, I said heaven, yeah, it's on the other side. Don't you know I said heaven, it's on the other side. I will make it, said I will make it, make it on home. One more time and we'll end it. 
Will you pray with me? Father, we are your people. And as your people, we have a hope set out before us. A hope you revealed in Scripture. And that Scripture was fulfilled in our Lord Jesus. Because of that, we lean into the future you have for us. Trusting that, just as we just sang, that whatever we might be experiencing in the moment, heaven is on the other side. And that because of that, we can live our lives with great boldness and courage and great joy. And we know that all of this is a gift from you to your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, before we jump into the message today, uh, one quick word about something on the calendar. Uh, as you know, uh, Alejandro uh, has accepted a position in Abilene, and they'll be making that transition this August. But before he leaves, we want to celebrate him and Paulina. And so be sure to plan to be here August 14th, uh, right after our worship service. Uh, we will gather in the ministry building for a meal uh, where we will recognize them and celebrate their time with us. So please mark your calendars and be sure uh, to be here for that. Uh, before we can read our passage today, we have to set the stage a little bit uh, because there's a lot going on in this, in this story. Jesus has been invited to a meal. and it's, It seems like in Luke... He is always either going to a meal, he's either at a meal, or he's leaving a meal. He, Jesus is constantly eating in the Gospel of Luke. And where we find him today is at a meal. He's been invited to join this banquet, being hosted by a prominent Pharisee. Uh, and we have to keep in mind that this invitation Jesus has received is not just kind of a casual hangout. You might extend to a friend, hey, why don't you all come over tonight? No, this is a very formal setting. This is like a, a black tie affair. I don't, have, has any, anybody done cotillion? Anybody doing cotillion down here? Uh, it, it's, you know, these very fancy dinner party. The guys are all dressed up in tuxes. The ladies are in evening gowns. And you get to learn all the social graces you need to survive in 18th century Vienna. It's very, very helpful. <laughs> But everything has these rules, right? There's a proper etiquette if you go to attend cotillion. How the table is set, where the knives and the forks, which side of the plate they go on, and which fork you ought to use with which course when it comes out. How you pass the plates around if you're going to pass the food. And of course, you have to know all the steps to all the dances. And if you don't know these things then you can end up embarrassing yourself because all of a sudden everyone knows you don't belong. That's the kind of setting that Jesus is walking into here. He didn't just get a text message from this Pharisee saying, hey, you want to come over tonight? No, he received an invitation on buttercream stationery. That's, that's what he's doing. And this entire occasion was a way of establishing 
how important you were. This party was a big deal. I don't know how many, I grew up in the, uh, the era of Jay Leno on The Tonight Show, but do y'all remember Johnny Carson? And occasionally he would have a, a new comedian out on the stage, right? And what did that young comedian want to have happen? You'd be invited over to be interviewed, right? Because that meant they made it. There was this social pecking order. If you got an invitation from Johnny Carson to come and be interviewed, well, now you can expect your career to skyrocket. Everyone is watching you. Everyone knows your name. That, that's the environment that these kinds of parties established. To be invited to a party like this meant you were in the pharisaical big leagues. You're rubbing shoulders with the who's who of first century Palestine. And everyone would want to be there. And, and just getting the invitation, while that was a big deal, it was more than that. Everything that happened at the dinner party established where you stood in that social pecking order. order. So where you ate, who you sat with while you ate, whether you washed your own hands or if someone washed them for you, there are these thousand little details that let everyone in the room know how important you are. And into that situation, Jesus shows up. And he does not behave himself. He shows up like Michael Scott at a dinner party. He makes everyone feel uncomfortable. Right from the get-go, he is doing things that you're not supposed to do at these dinner parties. It would almost be like, if you can imagine this, maybe you don't want to imagine this, if, if the whole praise team came up on stage in sequined costumes and had dance ribbons with them, you would be watching to see what happens, right? Because something is about to go down. That's the way Jesus walks into this room. Everyone knows who Jesus is, and what Jesus has said about the Pharisees. You whitewashed tombs. You unmarked graves. You brood of vipers. Woe to you Pharisees. Jesus shows up and every eye is on him because something explosive is bound to happen. So everyone's leaning in and watching, and you can cut the tension with a knife. And Jesus does not disappoint. He just cranks up the awkwardness. The, the first thing he does when he walks into the room, this is on a Sabbath, by the way, this dinner party they're hosting. It's a Sabbath dinner. And the first thing he does is he finds this man who has some swelling. And he says, he looks around at the people watching him and says, is it lawful for me to heal this man on the Sabbath? Daring every one of them to say something course they remain silent he heals the man and this is like the third time he's done this and every time the pharisees are just put off by it you're not supposed to do that on the sabbath that that counts as work but jesus doesn't care how they feel about that he's just healed this man and then after that he, he gives this unsolicited advice for how someone ought to operate in this room at this dinner party. He's watching all these people try to finagle their way into the most important seats next to the most important people. And he says, you know, the, the wise thing to do here would be to take the lowest, less prominent seat because then maybe the host will come and get you and pull you up to a more important seat, but it'd be real embarrassing if you were sitting already in the most important seat, assuming you deserve to be there, and the host is like, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to move down. It'd be completely embarrassing. And he's calling out everyone there for their anxiety about trying to make it to the upper echelon, to be the most honored. They're all scrambling to be the most important person in the room, or at least to be recognized by the most important people in the room. They all are chasing that, and Jesus just calls it out. So just quit that game. And so after all of that, all the awkwardness that both of those scenes already brought into the room, Jesus continues like this. 
Luke 14, verse 12. The, then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relative or your rich neighbors. By the way, be really careful inviting anyone to lunch today. You might be saying more than you realize. If you do, they may invite you back and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, but you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. I don't want the audacity of what Jesus has just done to be lost on us. He is in someone else's home, someone who invited him over to join him for dinner, and he's providing the meal for everyone, and then Jesus openly criticizes him. He says, you know, the next time, this is, this is all well and good, but the next time you have a dinner party, why don't you qu- try not brown-nosing all of your friends and do something good for a change. Why don't you invite the poor and disabled? You may not get an invite to their house afterwards, but knowing you, you probably wouldn't want to go anyway. I mean, he's saying all of this cryptically. And the tension in the room just continues to get amped up, so much so that one guy tries to kill the tension in the room by saying, blessed are those who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. Trying to redirect course, trying to say something that, of course, everyone in the room would agree with. I don't know about you guys, but don't we know that the people that will be at the feast of the kingdom of God will be blessed? Am I right? But Jesus doubles down. This guy's trying to kill the awkwardness, but Jesus just presses harder. He says, you know what? You're right. Those who eat at the feast of the kingdom of God will be blessed. And let me tell you exactly who will be there in story. Let me continue in verse 16. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet, invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town, bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you've ordered has been done, but there is still room. And the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Jesus tells this story where a wealthy, important host invites his wealthy, important friends. And we know they're wealthy because of the excuses that they give. I'm sorry, I just bought a plot of land. Only someone with money would be able to afford that. The next guy says, I'm sorry, I just bought five yoke of oxen, which is like the ancient equivalent of buying a Lamborghini. He has a lot of money. And all these excuses are lame. The last guy doesn't even make any sense. When you read commentaries on this passage, all the commentators are like, yeah, I don't know why this guy couldn't come. He's got married, so what? It's like saying, I'm sorry, I can't attend. My daughter just got, just graduated six months ago. I mean, it it makes no sense. He's just scrambling to find some excuse, trying to get out of this commitment he's made. Because the truth is, they've already RSVP'd for this party. This is not the first invitation. He already sent out a save the date. They knew this was on the calendar. But at the last minute, they decide they really don't want to attend, and so they've got to come up with some excuse that lets them get out of this social obligation. They're basically all standing this guy up. They came up with whatever would work to get them out of the commitment. 
And in response, this host tells his servant, well, look, we've got all this food, no one to eat it. We need to go find some people to share this party with. And so go out, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. And that's a big deal. Because what he is saying in the first century is basically, let's go invite those that everyone thinks are the farthest away from God. Because in the first century, the poor and the disabled were not just seen as someone who experienced some misfortune. No, the, the categories of poor and disabled were a moral and spiritual category. That's why only able-bodied men were able to serve as priests. That's why we read this in Leviticus 21. Say to Aaron, for the generation to come, for the generations to come, none of your descendants who has a defect may come near to offer the food of his God. No man who has any defect may come near. No man who is blind or lame, disfigured or deformed. No man with a crippled foot or hands. He may eat the most holy food of his God as well as the holy food, yet because of his defect, he must not go near the curtain or approach the altar and so desecrate my sanctuary. I am the Lord who makes them holy. A physical deformity was seen as a spiritual deformity. To be disabled was to be unholy, and your presence would desecrate something that was trying to be preserved and set apart as holy. You couldn't go where God was most present. And the same idea shows up in Job. When Job's friends are gathered around him trying to figure out what just happened to Job and why this happened to Job, they say, look, Job, you are covered in boils. You've just lost all your wealth. You have clearly done something wrong because this doesn't happen to good people. This doesn't happen to righteous people. I know you think you're righteous, but clearly you're wrong. Just look at you. And that's why the disciples are asking certain questions in the Gospels. Like in John 9, as they're walking by, they see a man who's been born blind. And the disciples ask him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind? His blindness wasn't just a physical thing. It had moral and spiritual implications in the minds of the disciples. And then in Luke 18... This is part of the story of the parable, the, the, the story of the rich young man who goes to Jesus and asks, what do you have to do to inherit eternal life? And ultimately, Jesus tells him, wonderful that you've obeyed all the commands, but one thing you lack, go and sell everything you have to the poor, and then come follow me. Jesus tells him all this in verse 25. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And listen to the way the disciples respond. Those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? If it's hard for the rich, those who clearly have been obeying, who clearly have been blessed by God because of their obedience, because of their righteousness, if those people are just going to squeak in, what hope do the rest of us have? Those who have not been blessed in those ways. Because this is part of the mindset to be poor or disabled was not just a physical reality. It was a spiritual and moral reality that meant you were far from God. And so in the minds of those listening to this parable that Jesus tells at this banquet, when they imagine the feast of the kingdom of God, you know what they picture? They picture a room full of people just like them. Full of people who have kept all the rules. Who have their lineage extending far back. And who have kept every Sabbath. Those who are able-bodied. Who have enjoyed wealth. The most important people of their day. That who, that's who they are imagining will be at the feast of the kingdom of God. And that's part of why they're all clamoring to get the invitation to this party. Because 
being invited to the party is not just a social occasion. It is a spiritual mark of approval. To say, oh, you are among the elect. You are close to God. Now come and share in this beautiful banquet for those who obey like you obey. Who follow God like you follow God. And when Jesus tells this story, he flips all of that on, his head, on its head. Because the people that look like them in the story refuse to go to the banquet. And instead, the very people who they consider undeserving and broken and farthest from God are eating at this feast. And it's as if Jesus is saying to them, if you'll just open your eyes, the kingdom of God and the banquet that comes with this kingdom has already started. This feast has already been laid out. And the invitations have been sent out, but you've declined. Because this feast is laid out wherever the poor, the crippled, and the lame are being being invited in and welcomed in, where they share in the hospitality of the all-merciful God. If you want to see the kingdom of God, that is where you look. You've missed it. You're so worried about climbing the social ladder, thinking you're getting closer to God, when actually what you're doing He's moving further away from him because God is not found where you think he's found. There is this sense in which the Pharisees just miss the point. They have the right trajectory. What what they want is right. They want to see the kingdom of God. They, They want to participate in this banquet it's just they've, they've lost the way. So Jesus says in Luke 17, in this conversation, once again with other Pharisees, where they're asking him when the kingdom of God would come, because they want to see it. Jesus replied, the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed. Nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. It's already here if you'll just accept the invitation. I think this is what we need to hear, church. That whenever we exclude those that we consider unworthy, what we're actually doing is excluding ourselves from the kingdom of God. That's the way that door opens. Whenever we exclude those we consider unworthy, we actually exclude ourselves from the kingdom of God. Jesus is turning the tables on us, and every time we shut the door on someone we assume or think is far from God, what we're really doing is shutting ourselves out of the beautiful feast that has been laid out for all humanity. And I hope we can receive this, because if we can learn to see the world this way, It changes the way we navigate even the space we sit in now. Can we receive 1960 as a gift? Can we allow Jesus to reverse the tables on us and begin to see that maybe it is us who are being blessed by our presence here more than we're being a blessing even? Because if we want to participate, if we want to feast at the banquet, we go to those that others might think are far from God, those who struggled, those who are in need. And all you have to do is drive down 1960 and see that need. The gift of this parable to us is that the kingdom of God is so very close. If we'll just accept the invitation, that we might be blessed. 
Uh, I want to end by showing you a picture. Uh, this is a painting of Dorothy Day, who, of course, is well known for her involvement with people in poverty. And so here is this depiction of her offering hospitality to a man in need. You can see the bowl of soup there on the table she's offered him. The cup of warm coffee he has in his hands. That warm hand on his shoulder embracing him. Dorothy Day is the one offering hospitality here, but I want you to notice something. Whose head has the halo behind it? Who is bringing the kingdom of God in this picture? Who is bringing the presence of Christ? Who is transforming this little bowl of soup and this cup of coffee into a banquet of the kingdom of God? How if we could have our eyes transformed and we begin to see the world in this way? What a blessing it would be to us. Let's pray together as this praise team joins us on stage. Father, I pray that our eyes might be healed. Our eyes that are so conditioned to see the world in certain ways. To assume who is important and who can be ignored to assume who we want to be around and those we want to avoid, to assume those who are closest to you and those who are furthest from you. We've been so conditioned, Father. But I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we might learn to see our world anew. And that we might come to celebrate how close we are to the kingdom of God. It is within grasp. If we will just have the courage to take a step in the direction of Jesus. To be healed of our own desires for prominence and importance. And follow you humbly we might sit at the table with our brothers and sisters beholding your majesty. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. And come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Just taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his own. Whoever believes in him will live forever. So bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son.
So church, this is an exciting day for us because today is our back to school bash. Uh, and so for those of you who volunteered, uh, just some final instructions. If you will make your way to the teen center, find Donna, Stephen, find a name tag, uh, and you'll get some final instructions over there. But uh, we'll need y'all to get over there pretty quick because we'll have people showing up here in just a little bit. Um, so please make your way uh, if, if you volunteered for that. Um, I love that we are a church that puts into practice the things that we've talked about today. That this banquet that we've imagined, that the Word has invited us to consider, is not just some theoretical idea. No, it is taking place already among us through things like what we're doing today. And we should celebrate that. That as we go today, please take the peace of Christ with you. And go and find the kingdom of God. It is ne very near at hand, church. Let's go in peace. Get right, church, and let's go home. Get right, church, and let's go. We'll home. get right, church, and let's go home. Get right, church, come on and get right, church. We'll get right, church, and let's go home. Well, you know that I'm going home on the morning train. I'm going home on the morning. Well, I'm going home on the morning train.